Hey, hello. Welcome to episode number 74 of the People We Love podcast. I am Adam Choit. Uh, what's up? Um, if you want to follow this podcast, it's at peoplewelovepodcast.com and the Instagram handle is at peoplewelovepodcast. And you can find me on Instagram as well, at Adam Choit, my name, if you want to follow me too. And remember to tap subscribe or follow on whatever platform uh, you listen to podcasts on. So, today's guest is comedian Jeff Senesek. Growing up in West Virginia, then Florida, he recalls the stark differences between the places. But no matter where he was, Jeff was always into sports, particularly tennis, in which he played semi-pro. And not only was he into sports, he was always into comedy too. He owned even more comedy albums than music albums as a kid. We talk comedy, L.A., and uh, even a little Marshall University sports, and a lot more. So let's just get started with Jeff Zanisek. So thank you uh, for joining me on the uh, Zoom, Jeff Zanisek. I appreciate it. How are you holding up today? I'm doing all right, man. Just trying to trying to survive, you know? Yeah. The world is a little bit insane, but... Uh, just breathe one, one, one breath at a time and go and go from and go from there. Yeah, that's right. We, we have comedy and podcasting, so we can still. Yeah, it's cool that we can still do that. So that's good. And we have no idea when comedy, uh, stand up comedy will go back to being able to be performed yeah. live. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm asking. We kind of we're talking about it a little bit. Before uh, we were well, before, uh, but, uh, I don't know, man, I, that I'm. Um, I'm a little worried about because it's like, you know, every, like the clubs I've seen, they're doing all this, like, oh, we're going to spread all the tables out, which makes every, every show I've ever done that's had spread out tables horrible. So like, they're going to do that. And then, you know, we're going to have like half the people, which, you know, great, you know, let's get less people in there. That's, that's always, you know. It's just it's just the opposite of what you need for stand up comedy live. Yeah, you want like, people closer together and and as much of them as you can. Yeah, you want you want to, want to be breaking a fire code with your comedy show. That's what that's like the ideal right comedy show. Like a room that's too small for the amount of people that are in the room and they're all stacked on top of each other. Those rooms are always the best. Yeah. Um, so Do they ever have AC? Do they have ever air oh, conditioning? Absolutely not. No. The 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 heat of a comedy club is actually very important too. Like you want sweatshop conditions inside of the comedy club for people to just be like, like, you know, this is horrible. Uh, I guess all I can do is laugh at how this guy's shitting on this entire place. And, you know, that's, that's what you need in a comedy club. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It sounds conditions. like you miss it. You miss yeah. it is what you're saying. You need, you need overpriced uh, food and drinks for sure. That needs to be there, you know? So that's what the, I'm not getting that out of the Zoom comedy show experience. <laughs> like a lot missing. of, yeah, that's what's missing. So every time I do a show on Zoom, I order like an appetizer from like a, you know, from Postmates. So it's like $25 for like eight chicken strips. And then I feel like I'm like, man, this is about as close as it's going to get, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. Well, how, how has the zoom show experience? Cause I, I'll be, I'll be honest. I have not uh, tuned done into one? any of them. No, I haven't, haven't watched one, watched one. Have you done one? No. Oh, do you, well, I'm not, it's a stand, like, I'm not a stand up. Oh, okay. Um, it's like, I mean, it's like, it's like this, it's, we, it's weird, you know, like, like <laughs> yeah, that's is, what I... it's like this, but I'm like, Hey, do your jokes. It's like, what? <laughs> it just it <laughs> feels weird to me. So, yeah. um, but I will say that I did one as kind of an experiment and I will say that the people that were like there, there were actually people like watching it and the people that were there were like very happy to be like engaging in some sort of like you know, activity of, you know, yeah. like a group activity. So, I mean, it's like, it's still not the experience of like going to a live show, but it's still like, it was, it was okay, you know, Yeah. but it's definitely yeah, not yeah. stand up. And I definitely also think that it is a, it is morphed like that will, you know, be a different thing than stand up. It's like an entire different, you know, way to do comedy. So I think it's more like, like, you know, 
because like people do like video podcasts, you know, so that's, right. that's not, it's not weird to watch Theo Vaughn talk for an hour by himself in a podcast. So it's like, but he's not doing stand up on there. So it, it like has a different feel and vibe to it. And I think people will adjust over time. Maybe it's forcing some comedians to sort of figure out how they can put funny content out in this video. Oh, for sure. Like, yeah, there, there is that. Yeah, which is, you know, it's good. It's like, a, I think when things do open up fully, hopefully they will like, we'll go back to a normal, not this new normal bullshit that they're talking about. That sucks. Like, I don't want that. Where they're like, we have to adjust to a new normal. It's like, cool. What does yeah. that mean? I have to wear a biohazard suit everywhere I go. I don't really <laughs> want to live in that world, you know? So I'm hoping that we eventually get back to like, you know, people can go outside and like, we don't have to like, put sticks in between each other and duct tape stickers to the ground and, you know, dress like we're trying to catch ET in the ET. <laughs> oh man. You know? I hope not. But yeah. I've heard, I've heard that, uh, the content I, that the comedic content that maybe be, might be more conducive to like zoom and online. is like stuff yeah. that's like games interactive mm-hmm. or like, if you have like one liner Twittery kind of jokes that you can just rapid fire at people or something. They can do that. Like, I mean, rant- suit- yeah, rants work too, I think, you know. So, but it's right. it's it depends, you know. So Yeah, I prefer the the live stuff. But why don't we get into your uh oh, yeah. to to your uh to your life and you were telling me you grew up in uh in Miami and Florida. Tell me about uh being a, a baby and the drive home from the hospital and we can go from there. Okay, Remember well, actually zero I was, years old. Yeah, when I was born actually I was born in Indiana. And then my family moved around all over the place, uh, mostly the Southeast. And then um, I, grew, I, I spent most of my life, I grew up mostly in West Virginia, Huntington, West Virginia, and in Jacksonville, Florida. That's right. Not Miami. I think I might have said Miami. Yeah, it's, it's all right. Um, but uh, I moved to Jacksonville, Florida when I was 15. So, and then I, you know, I lived there until I went to college. Uh, then I went to college in Virginia Beach. And then, you know, after college, I stayed in Virginia Beach for a little bit. Then I tried to go pro in tennis. And then I moved to uh, Florida briefly, back with my parents, trained there for a little bit. Then I trained in uh, Tennis Academy in South Carolina. And then, you know, just lived. It, it's kind of like doing comedy on the road because, like, you know, the tennis tours like all over the yeah, place. Yeah, you were trained for, trained for the road. Yeah. Yeah. I got the good I got the good outline. I saw some of this on the on your website here about the the tennis the tennis aspirations for sure. Why don't we go way back to uh you said Virginia and you, you were how old? What's Virginia? How old were yeah. you in there? Uh when I was 5, my family moved to West Virginia. So, uh I started school there. Uh that feels like where I like grew up because it's like the, the youngest memories I have are from like living in West Virginia, mostly. You have siblings? Uh, yeah. I have an older sister. Uh, she's like six years older than me. She, she, uh, you know, she lives in Virginia beach now, but, uh, she went to college in West Virginia cause that's where she graduated high school. You know? So what, what jumps out at you from that, from the West Virginia real young, what kind of kid were you? Um, like that young that you even remember where you were. Oh, dude, I was, I was all like, I was such a sports kid. I, all I did was play sports, you know, like there's, there's nothing in West Virginia other than like playing sports, you know? So, I mean, there's no, like when I moved to Florida, I got into like skateboarding and stuff. Um, but like that culture, like doesn't even exist in West Virginia. There's no beach. There's no, you know, skater stuff going on you know it's all like just like organized team sports yeah organized team sports it's like the mountains i'm trying to think because it's like living there as a kid was great because we like lived on a big like hill in the appalachian mountains and uh we had a big yard you know there was like a forest in my backyard you know so it's like you could like as a kid like go exploring and stuff but you know um but then I moved to like the suburbs of Florida and it was like every house is like, it's like every house is like super close to each other. And it's like in this like weird suburbs development where like 
everybody in your neighborhood's house is like built by the same guy. And it's like this, <laughs> it's like one of three floor plans. So it's yeah. like, you'd go to your friend's house and then you go in and then they're like, they're, I'm like, Oh, I got to use your bathroom. And then I go in and they like t- try to tell me where it is. And it's like, I know where it is. We have the same house. <laughs> the exact same that's, house. That's funny. I wonder what kind of, what kind of house exactly it was because I'm, I'm from Long Island and Levittown was sort of the first sort of, I guess, I don't know the entire history, but I think it was one of the first like town planning, you know, projects to make it, to build like a, a town. suburb. Right, exactly. Of all the houses that are okay, they're all going to pretty much look like this, be this size, and like in like a grid. Wow. Style. Yeah. Yeah. It's weird. Like when I moved to Jacksonville, we don't like that. It wasn't like that in West Virginia because like West Virginia has, um, I mean, I lived at this one dude built the house that my family lived in, and he built a couple of other houses on that hill, but like all of them look completely different. And They all like, they kind of had to also because it's like, where on the hill was it built? Right. We had like a three level house, but like all three levels were on the ground. They were all ground level, you know? So (laughs) it's because we were like on the side of a hill. So, um, but like, uh, and then you'd like go, you know, down the hill and there's like, some of my friends lived in trailers. Some of my friends lived in like, just super beat up old houses and you know then like if you go like through those neighborhoods and then like up this other hill there's like massive houses that these other like rich kids lived in and i mean it was it was crazy i mean it was like but it was cool because like everybody like it was like everybody was like we all like live together you know so it's like I don't know. I had like a diverse group of friends where it's like, if you live in the suburbs, like every one of your friends is like in the same socioeconomic class. So it's like, it's, it's like this weird, like stale, like Applebee's kind of lifestyle thing or whatever. But cause like, that's what was the vibe in. Yeah. That was the vibe in, in Florida. You were saying. Yeah. Like, yeah. Cause like that, the area we lived in was called Julington Creek. And it's like, this place was like massive and they were like building it up like super huge. It's almost like becoming its own like city. Um, but, uh, but then like just outside of it, there's like, you know, like when we first moved there, it was just sticks. Like there was nothing there. So like, for example, when I moved to Florida, I was 15. I had started playing tennis like two years. I started when I was like 13 or 14. And I had gotten really good at it. And then I moved to Jacksonville from West Virginia. And on my tent, I went to this one school that was like, it was like 45 minutes away. So like, it was like an hour long bus ride, you know, to get to school. And then um, we get there and there's like uh, all these kids uh, that played tennis with, uh, they all lived at the beach, right? So like we, our family lived like pretty far inland. Um, so then our school split. So like all the kids that lived at the beach stayed at that other school. And then all the kids that lived in the sticks went to the, the new school that I went to. And this when you were 14, what going to what grade did you say? It was like when I started high school. Like when ninth, you started high grade. school. Yeah. So like when I was in ninth grade, the school split. It was like the one school I went to. Uh, actually it was the same school that Tim Tebow went to Nice high school. And, uh, he, uh, like our school niece got, it was like super overcrowded. Cause it was like this was big he there place. When you were there? No, nah, he, he went a couple years after me. Gotcha. Um, and then, uh, uh, that school was so overcrowded when I moved there. Cause like, it was like this, like Jacksonville was one of the biggest cities to like, as far as like growth in the United States. So like, and our area was like growing huge. This um, was the high school you ended up going to, you were saying. Yeah. Yeah. Got yeah. It. So Nice split into three, like three high schools, like one third of the school stayed at Nice. One third of the school went to the new school. I went to Bartram trail and then another school was built called Pedro Menendez and a bunch of kids went there. So, um, and even, even now since then, like there's like 10 other high schools. I ended up coaching tennis for the 
one of the high schools and they're like, we played like, you know, there was like five or six call or high schools that we played that I was like, this wasn't a high school when I was a kid. Was it a hard adjustment um, moving from West Virginia to Florida or from middle school to high school, which was like the harder adjustment. It sounds like maybe even the, the thing split I, I kind of did even. both at the same time. So it was like hard, you know, that was pretty hard. But all, yeah, I, that all was simultaneously happening. Yeah. Cause like I, yeah, I moved when I was 15. So I had started, it was in the middle of the school year too. I'm, I started high school in West Virginia and all those kids I had like known forever. Right. I see. So then when I moved to, um, Jacksonville, I didn't know anybody. And, uh, so when I moved there, um, we, uh, yeah, it was, that was a hard adjustment, just like not knowing anybody. And then, uh, yeah, I made some friends eventually, but you know, that was brutal. Cause it's like, you know, I, I remember I, I spent a few weeks at high school in West Virginia and that was like an adjustment in itself. And I was like, man, this is crazy. But then it was like, all right, now we got to move. And I was like, Oh, actually this is crazy. You know? <laughs> so, um, but, uh, but then like a couple of years later, like after I lived in Florida for a while, I went back to visit West Virginia to visit a couple of friends. And then I was like, Oh, I'm glad I moved. This sucks here. This place is horrible. So like, yeah. you know, like West Virginia was like a cool place to live as a kid, but like as an adult, it's like pretty bad. There's like not a lot of opportunities there. That's what I was just going to, the word I was going to use. There's just not a lot of opportunities. There's very <laughs> little opportunities there, man. It's pretty bad. Yes. Yeah. And I, I've done comedy in West Virginia a few times since, uh, since I started comedy. So I've gotten to go back a couple of times since, and man, it's like, it's even worse, dude. Cause, uh, apparently like, you know how like Detroit is like a disaster area and stuff. Right. So, so like, since that happened, there's like a lot of heroin going up there to yeah, like, not good. To, to, yeah, but the, whatever, wherever heroin comes from, I don't know the, that drug trade, like the path, it goes through West Virginia where I grew up and like that city has been like destroyed. Like violence has gone up like super a lot. A lot of people are addicted to heroin there. It's like, it's bad. What so, city in West Virginia? Huntington. Yeah. It's where Marshall okay. university is. Right. Yeah. I used to, oh, I used man. to go to Marshall football games and basketball games with my dad. I got to see uh, Jason Lee, or that's his name, right? White Chocolate. The uh, Jason Williams. Jason Williams, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jason Williams. He was badass. We watched him play basketball in college. He was sick, yeah. dude. Chad then, Pennington. Chad Pennington. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say, yeah, he was the other one. I watched him, Chad Pennington, Randy Moss, Troy oh, Brown, Randy. and Roy, uh, Randy Moss, dude. The year we picked up Randy Moss was like it was insane. We went from like being like okay like our team was okay to like the best team in our conference. And like, we destroyed everybody and like yeah, every play was like, good. just throw it to Randy Moss, just throw it in the air and he will catch it. The most important, not to go too far off topic, but I feel like the most important skill as like a receiver is to be able to uh, make tough catches, be able to like have that instinct to find the ball, catch the ball, look for the ball. Dude like I don't, was filth, dude. I mean, it was like, it, it wasn't even fair. Like, it, it was bonkers. And what about your, uh, was comedy even something on your mind at all? Like, through growing up in high school, were you, what were, what yes. were you like, what, what did you watch as a kid? And, like, were you Dude, into comedy I, as a kid? I loved everything comedy as a kid. Um, I was one of those kids, I was like a total comedy nerd. Every, like, uh, when I was a little kid, I, I had more, um, I had more comedy albums than music albums. I always listened to stand up. I mean, that was like wow. my favorite. Yeah, it was my favorite thing. Um, I always wanted to do like sketch comedy or stand up or, you know, all that stuff. I was into all of it. Um, and then, uh, you know, my mom told me after I started doing stand up, she, she said that I, I, I said I wanted to be a comedian when I was like five or something like that, which is like weird because I'm like, I wasn't. You didn't remember like, I, that? No, I don't remember saying that. Cause it's like, what, I, when you're five, do you even uh, like, I don't think I even knew what it was. It, was, it certainly wasn't listening to 
Sam Kennison talking about getting his dick sucked or whatever, you know, like that doesn't no, make that, sense. That wasn't the album that, uh, <laughs> that inspired you at five years old. No. You never know. You know what? I, if I, yeah, but when I was a kid, I listened to more like cleaner stuff, but yeah. then, but stuff you, you don't know, understand could be funny. That's true. It could be just funny. The, the guy's voice sounds funny. You, you hear the people yeah. the laughing. It's almost like contagious because plenty of people have come on this podcast and told me that they've laughed at things on TV when they were younger and they didn't understand the joke or didn't understand everything. Oh, about for sure. It. Yeah. So like when I was a kid, I loved, yeah, I loved uh, Friday when I was a kid. Um, all that shit. I liked, uh, what was the other thing? Oh, dude. I remember when I was like eight, my mom bought me, uh, Adam Sandler's, they're all going to laugh at you album. Yeah. Right. So my mom was like, Oh, you know, my son loves this, uh, this guy that's on SNL. So I'll just buy this out. She did. She had no idea what it was. She bought the album. I was like, Oh, cool. I love Adam Sandler. So I listened to, I remember listening to it in the car with my friends. We were like on our way to like, I don't know, do something or some shit, probably like play baseball or something, but we were on our way to like some practice thing. And then I'm like, Hey, let's listen to this. And I put it in and there's a song on there called at a medium pace. Yeah. I know the song. And the first words of the song were, uh, spit on your hand and stroke my cock at a medium pace. And so it's like me, another 10 year old kid and my mom in the car with that coming on. And my mom goes, what the, f oh. she like flips out. She like shuts it off. She's like, what is this? Oh my God. And I like, honestly, at that age, I didn't even know what that meant. I was like, why would you yeah. do that to a rooster? That's weird. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and then, yeah. And then, um, yeah. Oh my God. And then, uh, you know, I loved it or whatever. And then my mom <laughs> was like so disappointed. I remember the next year or something like that. She bought me this, uh, she bought me this comedy album from this guy. I'll never forget this thing, dude. It was from this guy, Willie P Richardson. That was the name of this comic, dude. I looked at the album cover and I was like, mom, this thing is fucking stupid. <laughs> I don't, it said clean comedy on the album cover. And I was like, mom, this, I pointed at it. And I told her when I was like, I, I had to have been like 11 or 12. I was like, mom, I pointed at the clean comedy sign on the album cover. And I go, mom, see that it says this right here. That means it sucks. Like, don't ever buy me anything that says this. And then <laughs> she, was like, oh. she was very disappointed. But then, you know, but I mean, I did, I, I will say when I was a kid, I did like cleaner comedy just out of whatever. Yeah. Well, organically into. finding it. Yeah. Like, but it was, it wasn't like people that like advertise themselves as clean because like that, sure. it does suck, you know, cause it's like, you know, um, like I love, like, uh, I'll, I loved Brian Regan who was, I mean, he was super clean, but he doesn't like, it doesn't say that all over his album. You know, it's when just good you, comedy. Yeah. When did you get into him? Cause it sounds like you always loved comedy and you got into tennis. Did tennis ever like become like, Oh, I'm going to be a professional tennis player. And like how, like when did you start doing stand up? Yes. When did you get I, into Brian Regan? I'll let you do the chronology of all these, uh, uh, it's kind of all over the place. I mean, I, uh, <laughs> so that's fine. Yeah. So I, um, let's see, like, I mean, I always thought I would be like a pro athlete cause I was like playing like sports all the time. That's like all I did. Um, I, uh, like half my free time was dedicated to some sport related thing. You know, I played super high level baseball when I was a kid. I, had a uh, division one scholarship offers and uh, I, I didn't play in college though. I quit to play tennis in college. And, uh, and then while I got in college, I got a lot better. And then I, you know, wanted to go pro after college. And then uh, I, you know, I tried doing that and, you know, I did, I did okay. I mean, I, I'm, I feel like everybody feels that they're, you know, they could have done better than they did, but uh, I got to, I was ranked in the top like four in the state of Florida and men's open. Um, I won a, yeah. yeah, I won a national title in, uh, on grass, um, in, uh, Newport, Rhode Island, uh, the national grass court championships. I won that. How fast did you serve? Um, I could hit the like mid one thirties. Wow. With my serve. Yeah, that's, yeah. That will hurt me if it hits me. 
yeah. It doesn't hurt that bad. Getting hit by a tennis ball is not that bad. Uh, if it hits you in the That's air, it sucks, thing. but yeah. This ground slows it down if it bounces. Yeah. It hits it. By the, by the, like if you hit a 130 mile an hour serve, by the time it hits the ground and gets to you at the baseline on the other side, 78 feet away, it's going probably like 60 miles an hour. So it's like, it doesn't, like if you get hit by a serve, it doesn't hurt that bad. Unless like it's hit in the air and you get hit in the air. Yeah. But, you know, I've hit people before with, uh, overheads, but yeah, that was like my thing in college. Always try to blast the guy to the net. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any good tennis blooper stories before we get more into comedy and Brian Regan? Uh, I've hit tons of people <laughs> with balls for sure. I hit people all the time. Um, uh, this one guy, uh, he, sometimes people would do this thing. Like if, you know, one guy like lobs a shitty ball up in the air, like, and it's like short, it's like close to the net. You just, you like blast it over the fence, you know? Um, like you bounce it over the fence so they can't get it. Yeah. Um, they got to go outside. Yeah, they got to go get it or whatever. But um, I would, uh, I would, if the guy at the net would like, sometimes the guy at the net would try to like get in the way, like challenging you to like, oh, your, your wiener hit it at me or whatever. If they did that, I would throw everything I had into it and try to annihilate the ball at them. Because it's like, yeah, what, yeah. like, and it's also like, there's like a mental game of that too, where it's like the, the guy that's like, he'll stay in like the safest part of the court for you to hit it to. So it's like, he's trying to take away your ability to hit there. But like, if you're like, oh, I don't want to hit him, so I'll hit it over here. But you might miss if you hit it in the other spot. So I would just be like, I'm gonna hit it through you, and if you get hit, that's on you. Did you so, have a Michael? Did you have a Michael Jordan like uh, competitive fire where you would yeah. get a story <laughs> about hating your opponent? Did you hate yeah. all your opponents? <laughs> Absolutely, dude. Yeah, I can definitely relate to Michael Jordan and just like, you know, complete pettiness, like you know, and uh, the I don't know. No, I'm, I'm serious. I'm definitely like, like, yeah, yeah, I'm definitely like a over like I was always like an overly competitive you know like I can't do anything for funsies you know I like see. yeah so it's I mean even if I play like even now I play like softball and like these like recreational leagues but you know I'm trying to murder everybody when I play like I can't yeah, like yeah. there's no half stepping dude you know how does that go over with your softball teammates well it's it's Bad. fun now because I when I started <laughs> playing softball I started playing when I moved here, I actually started in this uh, comedy league and the, the level of play in the comedy league was pretty low, but, uh, but it was fun. I loved it. And there were some good players in there too, but, um, you know, uh, a lot of people were pretty bad, you know? So, um, but, uh, that I played in that league several seasons. I ended up like managing a team and, you know, I made a whole thing, which was, it was fun. I enjoyed it, but, uh, but that league eventually like disbanded and then I joined like a bunch of other leagues and then I got into some like more competitive ones. So now, now I play like pretty, I mean, it's, it's like fairly high level. It's pretty good. So nice. yeah, I played in a TV league too. That was, that one was not very competitive either, but it was like, it, there was like maybe like three teams that were like had decent softball teams and then like other teams were like horrible but every every team was a tv show like i played for brooklyn 99 and like you could tell which some of the teams would be bad like glee did not have a good softball team you know <laughs> a, lot, a lot of people can't throw on the glee cast you know so why even why even create why even have a softball team <laughs> i don't know i mean yeah if you're gonna there, be there, there yeah because they had there were people that were like you know like they put like this girl that's never played like pitching, which is like, that's the most dangerous position. You're 45 feet away, gently tossing a, like essentially a rock to someone that's trying to murder it. I played baseball and, and softball and I've always been a little bit fearful of pitching the, one, yeah, the yeah. three innings and four innings I pitched in my life. Like yeah. you have fear. It's so close. Yeah. I used to pitch in baseball. It, it didn't bother me in baseball. Cause at least like there's no limit to like what you can do. So like, like if a ball was rocked at me by a batter, it was like my fault for throwing a pitch that like 
he hit that good, you know? Right. So I don't know. I just, I didn't really have a fear about pitching really, but, um, but in softball, Oh my God, dude. Yeah. (laughs) I've seen people get wrecked. It is horrifying. It is is harder than it looks to pitch. So. Yeah. To land the, to get the ball. If you're a lot, if it's slow pitch to land it into the, uh, yeah, into that plate. Yeah. Yeah. Let's uh let's go back to like when you were younger and you said you were starting to get into comedy even when you were 10, 11, 12 years old. But what were you listening to in like high school? Is that when you got into Brian Regan? And did you ever have thoughts of doing stand up comedy yourself or it was all time? I always thought, yeah, I always thought about doing it. I was like, I always imagined I would do it at some point in my life. I didn't know how to start. You know, I didn't know there was open mics or any of that. I had no idea about that stuff. Um, and then, uh, let me see, I got into Brian Regan. I want to say I was probably about like 14 or 15 when I found out about him. I got his Brian Regan live album at uh, like a Barnes and Noble or something like that. And then, um, and then I, I like showed all my friends Brian Regan's album and, you know, he was like my favorite. He was great. Yeah, no, he's he's hilarious. He makes me laugh out loud for sure. Like yeah. I'm I'm thinking right now of just like the U two bit when he talks about like, you know, saying U two at the wrong time. Have a good flight, U two, have a good trip, U two. Yeah, he has so many like quotable, like great jokes. He's amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I took my mom to go see him a couple of years ago at a theater and that was pretty amazing. He's great. How, was that the first time you had seen him or you seen him live? Uh, that's the first time I had seen him live, yeah. I mean, dude, he was so good. And also what's weird about him too is like at the end of his set, he comes out on stage and people shout bits of his that he does. <laughs> That's like, almost what I was doing right there. Dude, yeah, yeah, exactly. Dude, you too got shouted so many times. They're like, dude, <laughs> yeah, I'm, dude, I'm a dude. cliche. He has so many but that's the thing about Brian Regan is so good is so good. It's like he has so many like just genius like quotable like amazing bits the one he did that was a encore was the um they kept shout the audience kept shout, shouting uh say eight have you heard that one maybe is that re- that he talked about like going to the hospital he had to go to the hospital he had to go to the emergency room dude it's so fun he like he does this whole long thing about i think it's from the i walked on the moon album or special, I think, but he talks about going to the hospital and it is so it's like eight minutes or nine minutes long. It is so funny. He can play the hits. He can come out and play the hits. And he, yeah. Is that, is that what he is? It is weird to, I mean, being a stand up now, it's, it's weird to think of like, if someone's like, Hey, do that joke you used to do. I'd be like, dude, shut up. No, <laughs> Like, don't, Cause, just because uh, someone's asking yeah well it feels weird to like just let me just get into my bit but it's like he can do it and he pulls it off great and he he nails it every time he's amazing but like i feel like it is harder to like it's harder than it looks to just start a bit when somebody's like pointing at you and is like all right do it now so you know? for the end of his shows he People are cheering at the end, and he uh, people clap, and then at this point, people are yelling bits, and then he comes back to the microphone or comes back out. No, and, and no, kind of- he, uh, no, he closes the show, and like he's a theater act, and everybody loves him. He's been around forever, so like he, standing ovation because he crushes, and then you know, then he comes out for an encore. You know, he like leaves. He's like, "Thanks, have a good night." Right. And like, oh, this is amazing! And then uh, then he leaves. Leaves the stage, everybody stands up. This is amazing! Like roaring applause for uh, like a minute straight, and then he he walks back out, and everybody like goes nuts. They're like, yeah, he's back out. This is the best. And then, um, and then he picks up the mic again. Everybody's like, yeah. And then he's like, you know, hey guys, like thanks. You guys are amazing. This is great. And then, uh, then he he says that like a lot of people want me to do you know bits that they've heard before, and I'm happy to do it. So. You know, if, if you guys want to hear one of my previous bits or something like that, like he'll and then everybody's like, "Say eight or you too." They're all screaming it out, I which say. is it's crazy because it's like, I mean, he's made like, I don't know, like eight specials or something. I mean, he's got so many, he's got so much material that's out that like 
just on a whim, someone could be like, Hey, do that thing from like nine specials ago that you probably <laughs> haven't done since like 10 years ago. And like, he can just nail it. Like, um, it's amazing. And yeah, he's, he's like he all in his, doing, yeah, so he's his doing, brain and stuff. Yeah, I was just so. Saying, so he's doing different, different closing bits, like all across his. Oh, for show. sure. Yeah. 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 So it's not, it's, it's not awesome. like he just does one act, you know, yeah, he or the same like, two. Yeah, he does a bunch. Yeah. Of no, he, I mean, he's had several hours and you know, I mean, that's kind of key for comics too. It's like, if you see one, if you see a guy, he crushes and then, you know, he comes back a year later and you're like, Oh, he's back. Let's see him again. And he does the exact same thing. You're probably not going to come out a third right. time, but like, you know, I mean, there's a few people that could probably do something like that. Like, uh, like Seinfeld could probably do one act for a long time, you know, but, uh, but you know, but, but even him, he doesn't do that. Yeah. You know? Nature of comedy. Yeah. He just, yeah. It's like people want new content from you as a, as a stand up Cause it's like, people want to hear what your take is. And then once, once they hear it, it's like, all right, wh- what else you got? You know, yeah. which is like the opposite for music. It's like, you know, Hey, play that one song. And they're like, we got new music, guys. Check this out. And everybody's like, yeah, shut up and play that one song that we all know, know already. You know? Yeah, people, I mean, people like new music too and want to hear new music. But yeah, it's like initially, yeah. initially it's like you have to like prove yourself like a Brian Regan by doing mm-hmm. a million, putting out a lot of original content. And then yeah. people will be like cool with the old stuff and even demanding it. Yeah, that is kind of like the opposite of music. I just, I just think with comedy, it's easier to digest new material than it is with music because people are like stubborn and there's like a comfort factor to like a song, you know. So it's like, okay. if like, for example, I listened to uh, Mumford and Sons, I like them a lot. And uh, the Mumford and Sons, they had a new album come out called Delta and I, I like been binging all their other shit. I'm like, man, they're so good. Like they're amazing. And then uh, Delta came out and I was like, oh, let me listen to this. I hated every song on there. I was like, fuck this. This sucks. They suck now. This is bullshit. And then like, I just didn't listen to it for a while. And then I came back to it later and I was like, oh, these songs are actually pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> like, what, is, what is it? What is it about that? that takes it's like a comfort to- thing. Yeah. It's, like, it's so hard and it's just, it's just like the nature of people. It's like people are used to like, they like, they're comfort. Used to. yeah, they're used to what they they're used to. And like with comedy, it's like, they're used to you as a person, not your material. So it's like, you know, they want you to come back and come back, but like they want you to say different things. Cause it's yeah, like, they're- they're used to you telling them new things that are funny. Exactly. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's what they're sort of like addicted to or drawn to as like a comedy fan. And with comedy, there is an element of like it being like a kind of a conversation. So like, you know, how many times do you want to like have, have the same the conversation? Same conversa- with someone? <laughs> you don't want to yeah. do that. It's like horrible. So yes. yeah, I was going to say, tell me about like towards the end of your, your tennis life and, I guess that's tra- I'm guessing that transitioned into comedy. Uh, yeah. So, um, let's see. So when I started, I started comedy when I was 25. So when I started it, I was trying to play pro tennis and, and then I, um, that's all I was doing. I was just playing and training all the time. And, ho- and, and comedy was a, like a hobby or like, a, I mean, I just like listened to it. I just listened oh, okay. to it. Oh, it was listening. I had yeah, never performed. No performing yet. Okay. But then when I was 25, I got injured playing tennis. I was out with like a back injury for a couple of months. And then um, I was just like laid up at my parents' house, like all, you know, depressed about like, this sucks. Like I got to start over. It feels like, I, you know, every time I get hurt, you know, all your physical progress with your game, like you have to take weeks off to, you know, heal your, bo- your body and stuff. And it, it just sucks going through injuries as an athlete. And then, um, and then, uh, I was like at my parents' house looking on my computer. There was a comedy club down the street from where I live that I've never been to. And I love stand up. I was like, why do I, why have I never checked this out? So I went to the website. I was like, I wonder who plays there. Like who plays at this comedy club? You know? So I look it up, I go on their website and on their website, there was like a, like a, like a link that said, like, if 
if you want to uh, do stand up, you can, you, you know, there's a class that we offer that you can take here that, you know, you can learn how to do stand up and like eventually like host a show. And I was like, Whoa, that'd be sick. I'll, I'll, I'll do that. So I signed up for that class and for like eight weeks, like you like write your joke. I mean, it was like a comedy class or whatever. You write jokes for like eight weeks. You go up on stage, you practice them to other comics. Everybody gives you feedback. And then, uh, then at the end of the eight weeks, you do a, a show and then, you know, and then at the end of that, the, the guy that owned the comedy club would determine whether or not you passed and could, you know, be a regular member of the workshop. And then, uh, with it meets like every Saturday or something like that. And then you would, um, and then you would, uh, like do local shows on like Tuesdays and Wednesdays. And did you do all these things? Yeah, I did all that. Yeah. And it was all a positive ex- experience for the class and everything. Like it's, uh, like yeah, it, I mean, it, it, at the right, time, it gets you writing, it gets you on, on stage. Is that like, yeah, at the time that like structure helped, you know, um, I think a lot of people like move to like a big scene, like New York or LA and it, like, they just start going to like shitty open mics at bars and stuff. And like, that is, I mean, I think that's like the most pure way of starting, you know? And, um, I think that's cool, but like, I, I, I don't think I've, e- I would have ever started if that was what the only way to do it. Cause I, I wouldn't even have known about it. Cause like being a sports guy, it's like, I, I wasn't really like, you know, I wasn't in like the party scene or like going to bars and stuff like that. Really. I was just kind of like doing sports. You know? Yeah. What, what were you writing about in that class? What was like the material? Uh, I just tried to talk about like my, yeah, I try to talk about myself and like what I, you know, where I came from and a lot of shitty observations it sucked, you know, oh my God, <laughs> it was pretty bad when I first started. Uh, I actually, I was, you know, since I liked Brian Regan, I was influenced by him. There's a lot more act outs, a lot more, uh, a lot more yeah. physical comedy than, than I, I'm proud to admit now, but you know. Yeah. It's, it's funny how like, I guess like comedians seem like often drawn to like imitating someone who they're not like, and then they ultimately like find like yourself, I'm guessing found your own voice. Like, yeah, that was <laughs> perhaps different than uh, than Brian Regan. Do you remember anything about that first uh, or the end of the class uh, first show that you did? Oh man, yeah, dude. I remember being like super nervous about the show. Um, the first show I ever did, dude. That thing was wild, dude. It was packed. There was like three hundred people there. Whoa. Yeah. It, oh my god. That's what's cool about those shows. It's like good and bad because it's like it's designed for you to annihilate because you invite all your friends and they come watch you. And then it's like, yeah. When people know it's a first show, you can get support. Everybody's like pretty supportive in that environment right. for sure. Um, and like the nature of that workshop too, like half the, like more than half the people that do it, it's like they suck. And it's like just some like, whimsical like i always wanted to try it thing and then it's like the worst comedy and then it's like they tell their they tell their office and then like their whole office is like steve from our accounting firm is he's doing so that they all go and it's like you know it's just the worst you know but like there's a few yeah do they i was gonna ask about the reaction to steve from accounting do they all what is the people who Steve brought out? Like, how do they react? Do they they're they're all they're supportive. Like, you can tell who brought who. Cause it's like some, you know, one guy would go up and he would suck. And then like everybody would go nuts and you're like, <laughs> there's all his friends, you know? Yeah, I gotcha. Yeah yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. So, I mean, people were supportive and stuff and it, man, but, but even with that, there were a few people that just ate shit, dude. And it was like so bad, <laughs> but like, yeah, I remember I went through the work. I went at so my first performance, I had to go after the worst guy in the entire workshop. We that's all knew good. he was going to do. Isn't that a good thing? Isn't that a good See, thing? See, that's the thing. I thought that would be good. Okay. But it's like the reason he was bad here, here's, here's what his thing was. This guy's name, we affectionately referred to him as Cancer Gary. Oh, no. Because Cancer Gary, he obviously he had cancer. 
And then uh, he talked about that. Not a lot of jokes around it. Oh, <laughs> definitely awesome. not strong enough jokes to justify bringing that up. So like, oh my God. And he just, he's one of those guys that like, he loved to hear himself talk. So like, so every workshop he'd go up there and he'd just like ramble for like a half hour. And it's like, all right, dude, you got to write some jokes though. You know, like you got to have some, like, yes, you're yeah. getting comfortable up there, but that's not necessarily a good thing because you got to be comfortable like in the pocket of doing jokes. You know? All the animosity is coming back. I, I, li- yeah, I so, like that. Well, I mean, I, I thought before that show started, I was like, okay, so Cancer Gary's going to go up. He's going to bomb for five minutes. <laughs> and then when he gets off, they're going to be like, you know, the next comics going to, or the host of the show is going to be like, all right, that's cancer Gary. Get, you know, whatever. Hey, everybody, the next person coming up, not cancer Gary. So here he is. And then everybody'd be like, yeah, that, it's not that last guy that sucked, you know? Uh, yeah. But, um, but here's the thing that, that Gary guy, he was a total ham. He loved to hear himself talk and he had, I guess his nerves got to him or whatever. He sucked so bad. They encouraged us to leave the mic in the mic stand. So like his mic was like sitting right here and he did this like through the show. He had horrible mic technique. So he was like doing this thing where he'd like, he would like look around the room. That was like another thing they told us. They were like, you know, make sure you're like trying to make eye contact with everybody. So it's not like super awkward. Cause if you just stare one place, you look weird. And if you just like bob your head around, you look weird. So he was trying to do all this stuff that they, told him to do but he was it looked terrible he was like he had like he looked like a sprinkler head just like kind of bobbing his head around and also he did he forgot that you have to talk into the mic that's the only way it picks up the sound so like he was kind of like looking around so he'd be like so guys like you think that, uh, <laughs> we kept like doing that and then i remember being i was backstage so i couldn't see but i could like hear and it was like dead silent, like the whole time he went on stage. And then he like, he said he had cancer. It somehow got quieter than like silence. <laughs> and then, um, and he was still doing this, like talking over here poor and Gar- talking Ga- into it. What's his name? Ga- Gary? Yeah, cancer Gary. <laughs> <laughs> poor guy. Yeah. So, but then, but then with his like head bobbing around and like not directly talking into the mic, at one point I heard somebody in the audience scream at him from off stage, like, Hey, talking to the fucking mic. And then, uh, so, and then that, that was weird. It got weirder after that. And then he was only supposed to do five minutes. So I was looking at my watch backstage, like, like nervous about it. I'm like, Oh fuck. Yeah. I'm assuming he's going to go long. I'm already ahead of you. Yeah. absolutely. (laughs) And like, dude, like my soul, like was uh, the nerves I felt like the first time I went up were insane. So it was like debilitating almost. Um, so like, you know, I remember looking at my watch going like, all right, he's got four minutes left. And I looked at my watch again. Okay. He's got three minutes left. And I looked at my watch again. Okay. He's got a minute left. Then like, I'm like, all right, here we go. And like, count, like just spazzing out in my head, counting down. And then he's like, I'm looking, looking at my watch. I'm like, okay, he should wrap up now. And he's not, what is happening? It was just like making me like more stressed out. And then, um, and then he went like three minutes long. It was the longest three minutes ever. And then, uh, then I had to go up after him. And if I, I don't remember much about it, but I do remember doing okay. And then uh, I remember forgetting my worst joke and then just saying that, that I forgot it. And then that went pretty good. And then, uh, you know, and it was, I don't know, it was, uh, it was an okay performance, I thought. But, yeah, you got uh, through it. Yeah, yeah, I did it. So I felt okay about it. Okay, so what happened with to, to with uh, show number two and with your comedy uh, comedy life after uh, after that? Were you, were you were still uh, recovering from uh, uh, tennis? Your tennis injury. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So I stopped. Yeah, I had to stop t- playing tennis for like a couple of like two months or so, and that's about how long that workshop was. And then when that started, I started playing more tournaments and stuff. But then after that workshop, I never stopped going to shows and trying to get better and all that stuff. 
but I was like kind of like doing it on the back burner of like my comedy stuff. So like when I was in town training, I would like train during the day. Then I would go do this uh, comedy stuff at night. And then, um, you know, and then I started hosting shows. So I was doing that a couple of like, maybe like once a month I would host a show and then I'd still play tennis tournaments while I was doing that. And then, um, then I, uh, started doing shows on the road a little bit. So I started like middling all these, all these clubs all over the Southeast and then, uh, did that for a while. And then eventually I got to a point where I was like, all right, I have to move to New York or Los Angeles to get to the next step in my career. So, so then I moved out here. You know. So how long after you had started comedy was tennis officially your tennis career officially done? Uh, when I was like, I, w- I want to say like 28 or 29, I, uh, I, uh, tore a ligament in both of my wrists. Uh, not at the same time. I tore rig- a ligament in my right wrist. Uh, and then I had to get surgery. So that put me out for about a year. Then I tried to come back after that. Cause I was playing the best tennis I had ever played at that point. And I was like, man, I feel like I'm on the brink of this. Like, you know, I was starting to like, I was playing these like qualifying draws for like pro tournaments and I like almost getting in. And, um, I was like, you know, I know I can win now. Cause it's like, there was, you know, the guys I was like losing to, or I was like having tough matches with guys that were like getting ahead and like doing stuff, you know? Right. So, so, uh, you know, I could see the finish line to a lot of those matches. I felt like I could beat anybody if I just keep going. But then like my wrist was like obliterated. It hurts so bad. Like, so then I had to stop, get the surgery. And then while I was recovering from that surgery, I focused more on my comedy. And then I started practicing tennis left-handed a little bit. So I was like doing some stuff left. I didn't like play tournaments or anything left-handed, but I was like still like training and practicing just to kind of stay fresh. Um, And like you're, I have a two-handed backhand. So it's like left-hand dominant shot. So it's like, I'm kind of still working on my backhand um but then uh but then when uh i got over the left wrist actually while i was still sorry while i was still recovering from the right wrist surgery my left wrist started hurting and then i went to the surgeon and the surgeon did another mri on my left wrist and they were like that one's fucked up we got to do that one too so i was like oh "Oh, man that put me out for another year Wow. So I did back to back and I tried to play again after and I, you know, I won some tournaments and stuff, but, um, you know, at that time I was like, you know, like 30, 31. And I was like, man, like my body would hurt more after, you know, I played tournaments and stuff. It's very taxing on your body to play like a tournament, you play I match, bet. play match every day, sometimes two, depending on like the type of tournament you're in. You're there the whole week, you know, I mean, it's, br- it's brutal. So, you know, um, but, uh, so then eventually, and like I was doing very well with comedy stuff. So it's like, you know, I feel like I have a better chance at focusing on this. So, you know, so then I just started leaning into doing everything I could comedy, you know? It's awesome. Yeah, man. It was it hard to, it must've been hard to, to, to some degree to, to give up tennis and, and have face that reality, I guess. Even though oh, you absolutely. were going to, it helped, probably helped to go towards something with comedy to have direction as well. So how, what was that time period like when you kind of transitioned? Um, well, I mean, I always like kind of, it wasn't too bad of a transition because I always like kind of was preparing for it, you know? Right. Because like with tennis, it's like you transition into like coaching and stuff, which I still do some coaching sometimes. But, um, you know, but yeah, it's... I was always trying to prepare for yeah, doing comedy full time. And most tennis players, even professional, don't play super late into their, into their what, the late 30s or even. Well, that's 40s. changing now, man. Like the top, so. top three players, it's like Djokovic, 
Nadal and Federer and all those guys are in their 30s. Federer is like 37, I think. Yeah. Nadal is like 35 or something like that. And Djokovic is, I think Djokovic is the youngest, but he's in his 30s, I think. Yeah. But and those guys are the three best players of all time. But that's 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 also weird too, because like that's not been a thing for sure. Like Pete Sampras retired at 32, and he was like dead when he <laughs> yeah. like he literally was like I I'm dead. <laughs> like he stopped <laughs> at the end of his career too. Yeah. So he like won a slam when he ended too, which was pretty cool. So, did you have a favorite tennis uh, player? Yeah, uh, it was this Russian guy Murat Safin. <laughs> He was my favorite player. Was he? Was he? I, I, I'm not sure if I even know him. He won. He won two Grand Slams. Yeah. Uh, he won the U.S. Open in 2000, and then the Australian Open in 2005. I think he was one of the most talented players of the era. Um, but then uh, he was a head case, though. He was, but that's what made him fun to watch. Yeah, I see. He he had the record for most broken rackets on the tour. Yeah, which was pretty funny. You like the he was always a funny guy. Yeah, he yeah, had a lot I, of personality. It, it all makes sense now. It all makes yeah. sense now for sure. He was great. I love that guy. Yeah. Tell me about the journey to uh, to LA and and beyond, and and how did that all come about, and what was that? Uh, uh, moving to LA was uh, was tough. Um, I moved here in 2016. Uh, it was uh, you know, I packed up my car and. You know, I drove out here. Yeah, it was it was brutal because at the time I was going through like a, I had dated a girl for six years. We broke up, and then we were supposed to move to LA together, and then uh, we broke up like a I don't know a couple months before that was supposed to happen. She went to New York, and I was like, oh fuck, you know, am I still going to go to LA? I don't know. And I was like, well, I'm going to do it by myself, I guess. You know, I definitely have to do i felt like i still had to do it you know i have to do comedy so uh so i went to la and um and then uh just tried to get acclimated to the scene out here and uh yeah it's been tough man it's a tough it's a tough scene out here it's huge there's you know it's the opposite of like jacksonville you know like jacksonville's comedy scene it, it was like if you do comedy there's somewhere you're supposed to be every night. And if you're not there, you're probably not doing enough in your comedy. But then like, you know, then there's, you move here, there's 10,000 places you could go every night. And like, what's crazy is like, there's probably like four or five options that are good options for you to do. Isn't that a good thing though? Aren't these good things? No, it's good. Yeah, it's good, but it's also, it's easy to get lost. So it's like, you can, you can be like, well, I'm doing, com you could do comedy every day and it not necessarily, you're not going in the right direction. You know what I mean? Yeah. You hang around with a, the wrong crowd. You could be hanging out with a wrong group. That's another thing about comedy out here too. There's different uh, cliques of people that do comedy. Whereas like in, Florida, there was like one group of comics. So it's like everybody was, we're all comics. But here there's like, there's like the, there's the, you know, people that hang out at this club. And then there's people that like hang out like at these alternative shows. Then there's people yeah. that hang out on this side of town. Then there's people that hang out on that side of town. So it's like, you know, we're, like you, you actually kind of have to find like a group that you fit into and then like kind of, I don't know, try to support each other and branch yeah. off from there, like a home yeah. base almost in a sense. Yeah, there is some of that for sure. So it's weird, man. It's a weird, you, uh, weird is scene. it more, is it, is it, do you find the LA scene clicky or is it more just different people with different circle, you know, circles of friends and, and different sort of interest in comedy? Is it, is it, is, is it exclusive or other, or other, are people, is, I mean, obviously you, the best way to, to get respect is to, grow your own audience and get laughs and be successful that will I'm sure, that, that I'm sure attracts a, any group but is it do you find it like yeah I find it hard I find it hard for sure but I don't know man it's it's yeah it's hard to find your group and like 
you know, people that support you. That's another thing too. It's like a lot of people don't want to support you unless you can give them something. So it's, you know, like if you run a show out here that helps, that helps your comedy career more than like, than anything, you know? So. Cause you can help get people stage time. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't want your show to be a piece of shit either. That's the other thing. It's like, right. You know, I ran a show for a little bit, became a piece of shit. And it was like, well, let's just stop doing this. This isn't helping anybody. In LA or in? In, in LA. I and mean, I was like, in, I was in, when I was running a show and like, we'd have like nobody in the audience. I'd be like embarrassed that we were even doing a show. So I was like. Yeah, that's the hard part. The hardest thing is to get people to. Yeah. And it's like, I don't want to, you know, I'm trying to give people opportunities to like work on their material and stuff. And then they come there and it's like depressing because no one's there. It's like, man, it sucks. I can't, you know, can't do this. But our show used to be good, and then we had to we moved the day of the week. I think the day of the week changed. We were on Saturdays, then we moved to Wednesdays. Then yeah, it was hard to. That's pretty different, you know. For sure. So, but what some of the other uh, challenges uh, about doing now, comedy, like doing comedy in LA, or some of the, the benefits. I mean, yeah, some of the well, the comedy. challenges the to, the challenges now of doing comedy is just doing it, and like, if it is it a career? Do, can it exist again? I don't know. That's true. But, but yeah, so I mean, it's like, yeah, that's that's a weird thing, but that's an issue to contend with. Yeah, but um, I don't know. I think now with comedy. I mean, I don't know. Some places are opening up in other states, so you know you can probably get back on the road a little bit. But I can't imagine that being a great. It's going to be to, slowly, slow yeah, moving. It's I think. Slow for sure. Yeah. Let's see how it goes, man. Because it's been it's been wild the last couple of months. So. Yeah. What are some of the? I hope there are some highlights of doing comedy in LA some of the many memorable shows or moments oh, yeah, I got, or yeah, people you yeah. worked with yeah absolutely I've, you know, I've met some great comics and some people have helped me out and you know um, Theo Vaughn I worked with him when I first moved here and he was, he was super nice great guy um, super funny too he, amazing um, and then uh, and then uh, I visited New York uh as like, uh, I might move there. So I looked into New York before I moved here. And, uh, when I was up there, I was in a comedy festival up there. And then, uh, uh, I worked with Nikki Glazer in Florida. We met, she was super cool and nice and great. And then I reached out to her when I came to New York and she actually helped me get into the stand and get spots at the stand, which was nice. So she was really helpful and great. And then, That's cool. Uh, yeah, man, it was cool. And then I worked with, you know, I worked, that was what was cool about Florida. Cause I got to meet some of the, like the higher level comics that like came through, you know, they came through and they're like, they're, they're cool to me. You know, Theo's nice to me and Nikki's nice. I haven't seen her in a long time, but you know, Nikki's cool. Wendy Liebman helped me out a lot. I worked with her and she helped me get into a couple of clubs out here. Um, I ran into her. I opened for her in Florida. Then I met her on the road again. Then, um, then I, I came out here to visit for like a week and I happened to go to a show that she was just on. And I was like, Oh my God, I can't believe you're here. And she was like, what the, what are you doing here? I'm like, I'm moving here. She's like, Oh my God, that's great. She actually helped me a lot when I first moved here. So she was amazing. Um, it's awesome. Yeah. Wendy Liebman's real cool. And then, um, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, uh, I met Tony. I did a show with Tony Hinchcliffe right before I moved here. He was cool to me. I meant, uh, I, w I wasn't hanging around the comedy store that much though, but, uh, but when I did, he was nice. He'd say hi to me if I saw him, but you know, but yeah, man, it was, I don't know. The scene's good. I mean, it's just like, it's weird. Like, it's like, I don't think I'm, I mean, I'm definitely nowhere on those people's levels, but, um, you know, I'm just trying to climb my way up as much as I right. can. You know? It's just hard now because it's like a lot of a lot of comedy in LA was like, you know, spending time at these clubs trying to like, you know, show face and like make a, you know, you know, make right. friends in the scene. Yeah, make an impression on the people that are like 
ahead of you in the career and then, you know, in their careers and try to be good. So it's like, now it's like, it's like everybody's like, you got to do all digital stuff now. So it's like, there's, you know, people, you can't really like get the community out of the scene that you, right. That you used to be able to get, but you know, yeah, you're disconnected from an audience, but you're also disconnected from each other. Yeah, dude. It's uh, it's tough. So. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> I mean, I feel for the, the comedians for sure. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I don't, I don't mean to be a, I don't need to, I don't mean to be a bummer or anything like that. But yeah, what the hell, man? It's not pretty. Yeah, bad, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, it's all good. No, it's uh, no, it's been, you know, comedy's cool, and you know, I think it'll come back eventually. But uh, and then also uh, on the bright side of this stuff, it's like it has forced me to like kind of get into more like digital stuff and like kind of, you know, it was always a goal of mine to like put more things online, but now I'm like doing right. it a lot more now for sure. So what is, what would you say is your like long term or even shorter term? If, you know, if assuming comedy gets back to what it, you know, what it used to resemble, like in, in stand up or even acting or otherwise, is it to just uh, be touring the country to have a, a special, to be acting in, in something as well that you, that you create? What is, where, where do you see yourself in, in the future? Well, um, I want to try to do more collaboration, get more things going. Uh, I wanted to get into acting more, so that would be good. Um, you know, I want to get, you know, agency representation and all that stuff and, you know, getting some of my comedy on like a uh, TV or something like that, you know, um, you know, I was doing well in the festival circuit. Like I've been in a ton of comedy festivals and, um, you know, I think that that's been good. I've made a lot of contacts through that, you know, people that can help me out in the the business. I just think I have to be more proactive about like reaching out to those people, you know? Right. Like I didn't, I'm, I'm like a guy that like, I don't like to ask for help. So, but I think at some point you do have to, you know, you don't, uh, no one's going to help you if you don't ask them. I think. Right. So, so yeah. Right. You feel like you want to just do it on your, your own or you don't want to, you don't, it's more like, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I kind of, I guess, experience something similar. It's like, you don't want to feel like you're bothering someone for something. You're asking for something, you know, it's like, you're, it's a, yeah. imp, imp, you're imposing in a sense, but even if yeah. it's something they want, you don't see that they might want to and take joy in it, which is yeah. possible if they like you. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's definitely been people that have offered help. Um, you know, I've traveled on the road with Jeff Dye a bunch of times. He's been super helpful to me. I mean, I, um, yeah, he, I, uh, I opened for him on the road too, and he's helped me out a lot since I moved here. So he's had me on his podcast a bunch of times and, uh, you know, he's taken me on the road with him a bunch of times. I mean, he's been super good good dude and we became like pretty good friends so i'll hang out with him sometimes when i'm here and that's been cool so but yeah Yeah, it sounds like you've had quite a journey and and it sounds like you want to get to the next level and then to the next level by hitting you know some tangible benchmarks and you're in your career and just just you want to just keep it at it and just grinding Yeah. yeah dude i'm trying man i um you know i think now uh i've I finally gotten into like a project that I'm like pretty excited about. So I've been, um, I started a new, um, podcast. So that's been good. Yeah. Uh, you can talk about it. I was going to say like, you know, I've okay. taken up a lot of your time. So you can plug whatever that's you're cool. working on, talk about whatever you, you want to promote. Or, yeah, I, start, or I started, a, share. yeah, I mean, I started a, uh, satirical podcast with this, uh, buddy of mine. Um, I play a character on there, uh, but our podcast is called the two woke boys and it's spelled a uh, T O O. Uh, <laughs> so we're too woke. And, uh, yeah, my character on there is, uh, you know, we're both like male feminists and like, you know, we give takes on what's going on and everything. And it's been, it's been pretty fun, man. It's been, that's the thing I'm probably the most excited about right now. We do videos on our Instagram account and, uh, you know, hopefully we'll do more stuff on like an actual feed and it, we just started it like a month or so ago. So it's, 
you know, we're trying to figure out how to expand it and branch out and get as much stuff as we can on it. But the people that have seen it really like it. And a lot of people are like reaching out to me and telling me they like it. So, you know, check it out if you can. I will. And then, um, then I have a podcast that's me. Uh, it's called the grounded podcast with Jeff Zinesek. And then, um, yeah, follow me on Instagram, Jeff Zinesek and TikTok if you got it, you know, so I'm trying to get out there as much stuff as I can. So, you know, Z E N I S E K. That's right. I got it. Well, again, yeah. I appreciate your time. Great stories. Uh, it's a lot of fun. I talking Florida, talking uh, West Virginia, talking LA. Yeah, man. a lot. Yeah, man. I, uh, I had a good time. Thanks for having me on the show. Super fun. But, you got uh, it. Enjoy yeah, the rest of your evening. Yeah, man. You too. Later. So there you have it. My conversation with Jeff Sanasek. That was a lot of fun. I thank Jeff for his time. For real, I do hope Cancer Gary is doing okay and is healthy. Just uh, not doing comedy. Anyway, for everything about this show, of course, head to peoplewelovepodcast.com. And I think that's about all I got for today. I appreciate you guys listening. Thanks as always. And let's talk soon. Peace. Peace.